And good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us on this summer afternoon. Um, and thanks for being part of this important conversation uh, for today's Knockout Open Abuse Day Learning Series webinar. Uh, this webinar series is a continuation of Knockout Open Abuse Day, which was designated, as uh, Greg mentioned, October 6th each year by Governor Murphy. And this learning series is designed to continue the awareness and education highlighted by that initiative throughout the year. Today's presentation, The Opiate Epidemic, a focus on vulnerable populations, is brought to you by the Partnership for Drug for New Jersey, is being held in collaboration with NJ Cares and the New Jersey Office of the Attorney General. And I thank them for their partnership, support, and collaboration on today's learning activity. Our featured expert speakers for today's webinar are Christine Scalise, and Dr. Katherine Findlay from the New Jersey Department of Human Services, Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Brad Christensen from the New Jersey Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. And Dr. Kathy dodsworth Ragani from Rutgers uh, Project ECHO. So I welcome you all today. I thank you so much for your time um, as our panelists and our expert speakers. And uh, we'll kick things off and I'll turn things over to you, uh, Christine and Catherine. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate as a panelist. Uh, this presentation will provide a brief overview on pregnant and parenting women with opioid use disorder, as well as other substances that we refer to as special priority population. We will introduce initiatives to promote healthier birth outcomes, as well as helping mom and her family uh, have healthy recovery from substance use. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so prior to the 1980s, women with substance use disorder received addictions treatment with men using a male dominated uh, treatment model. Thankfully, women's treatment has changed through the years with the implementation of gender-specific approaches, which, is a focus, which focuses on trauma that women with substance use experience that could range from physical, sexual, emotional trauma, which leads to post-traumatic stress disorder that could go on for years if it's not addressed. In 1993, Congress appropriated funding through the Federal Substance Abuse Block Grant to the states and territories to support gender-specific treatment with the Women Set Aside funding. New Jersey's Women Set Aside Fund supports a statewide network of licensed treatment providers in all levels of care for pregnant and parenting women. Pregnant women have priority admission to treatment especially women who are IV drug users. Our state contracts require, in addition to addictions treatment, that there's provisions and assistance to these women that are in treatment around transportation, childcare, prenatal linkages, housing assistance, wraparound services, and recovery supports. Next slide, please. The core principles of gender responsive treatment is embedded into what we identify as best practices for women with substance use. We recognize and know that women experience unique challenges that can have an impact on their way to recovery. Women experience socioeconomic issues that could include housing issues, legal issues, financial issues. Their role in relationships with significant others and family is important to them. They could have health concerns such as lack of prenatal care or postpartum health issues. There's cultural and societal attitudes towards women who use substances. And this impacts their role as caregivers, which makes them targets for stigmatization. Stigma is more profound when she's pregnant, when she's using substances, when she's pregnant, during the birth event, and when she's parenting her other children. The SAMHSA, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, has a TIP 51, which is a guidance that's offered to the community providers and administrators on what is identified as specific needs of women who use substances. We consider this a special population. Services must be trauma-informed, 
gender responsive treatment that's strength based using a multidisciplinary disciplinary approach to treatment. Next slide, please. Back in 19, and back in 2014, New Jersey participated in SAMHSA's Prescription Drug Abuse and Other Opioids Policy Academy. It made us the state eligible to apply for in-depth technical assistance on substance exposed infants and neonatal abstinence syndrome through the uh, National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare. There was no funding attached to this, but this, um, initiative technical assistance brought our three state departments together that's department of human services child well uh, child of children and families and um, departments of health simultaneously when we applied for this technical assistance we recognized that our new jersey treatment admission data reflected an upward trajectory of pregnant women whose primary substance use was heroin and other opiates at the same time, we saw a significant increase in referrals to our treatment system from child welfare, and our labor and delivery hospitals were experiencing an increase in substance exposed infants. Our IDTA state lead leadership included key staff from departments of human services, children and families, and health. We had 60 representatives from our medical addictions, maternal child health, and child welfare community. And our departments recognize that pregnant women subst with substance use are involved with our three state, state systems. Our departments, we identified four goals. We needed to strengthen collaboration and linkages among our addictions, treatment, child welfare system, and our medical communities. We needed to focus on improving services for substance using pregnant mom and outcomes for their babies. And overarching, we saw such an increase in opioid use and misuse with pregnant women. We needed to develop uniform guidelines across the three state systems so that we were all on the same page on what the practice recommendations should be. And we wanted to improve collaboration along the entire spectrum of care for a woman when she presents prenatally through postpartum labor and delivery and continuing care. How do we improve birth outcomes for the woman, her infant, and her family? Next slide, please. The in-depth technical assistance work with the assistance from the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare helped guide our departments to develop a comprehensive care and coordination model where the addiction providers, the medical community, and child welfare could work collaboratively towards helping to improve outcomes for the special population, for pregnant and parenting women who were using opiates, and of course, other substances. So in 2018, the departments developed two initiatives for this population. The Maternal Wraparound Program focuses on pregnant women with an opioid use disorder and up to one year after birth, and our Integrated Opioid Treatment and Substance Exposed Infants Program works with pregnant mom from pregnancy up to 16 weeks after birth. At the same time, we recognized that we needed to educate the community at large on what the best practice recommendations are for this population and what is the availability of resources within the community by launching a Project ECHO, which Dr. Kathleen Dodsworth will be uh, uh, presenting more on what the uh, ECHO is about. Next state, the uh, next uh, slide, please. The um, maternal wraparound and the integrated opioid treatment program address the five major timeframes when intervention in the life of an infant can help reduce potential harm of prenatal substance exposure. During the pre-pregnancy phase, there is the awareness of what substance use effects are on the on the uh, infant on the uh, prenatal piece. The prenatal portion is very important. There should be universal substance use disorder screening. And if indi indicated, there needs to be a referral for assessment to treatment. At the birth stage, newborns are tested who may be prenatally exposed to help see what services would be in place, as well as the neonatal phase where healthcare providers can conduct developmental assessments ensuring that the newborn and their family can access service. This also ranges throughout 
the early uh, birth through early childhood up to age zero to five. Families need services so that there could be the supports to help them through this process and really helps assist mom through her recovery. Next stage. The maternal, uh, next slide, sorry. The maternal wraparound program is, was awarded to providers through a joint request for proposal. Departments of Human Services and Departments of Children and Families, we work together to uh, develop this innovative model. As I mentioned earlier, the target population is pregnant opioid dependent women and services are regional, regionalized across the state. This program combines intensive case management and recovery support peers. The case managers provide non-clinical assistance and the peer recovery specialists provide peer supports. The staff work closely with mom and her family and they're with them from the pregnancy phase through up to one year after birth. This state fiscal year, I'm pleased to announce the maternal wraparound services will, no longer, will not only be exclusive to opioids, we are expanding the maternal wraparound to include all substance, substances, and we've increased the number of pregnant women eligible for services in each region. We are starting to see data that due to COVID-19, women are um, using substances that during pregnancy, and we are concerned about the increase in other substances. So we were a eligible because of federal grant funding to increase the population to include all substances. Next slide. The Integrated Opioid Treatment Program was also awarded through an RFP with funding from our governor's opioid state funding. And this initiative provides an array of integrated services that ranges from treatment, mom's medical care, child welfare services, intensive case management, housing assistance, and, and uh, recovery supports. Currently, we have four providers statewide, two in the southern region, two in, in the, Merce, in the uh, central part of the state, and we will be issuing an RFP for the northern region this state fiscal year. Next slide. The initiative goals, as I mentioned in my earlier slides, are really towards a focus of improving birth outcomes for women with opioid use disorder. And that can be done through the alleviating barriers to services, providing a comprehensive care coordination model. This helps move the reduction of risk to prenatal substance exposure. And the ultimate goal is to promote the sustainable recovery for women and their families. Both initiatives have a data collection and research component and I will turn over the slides to our Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services researcher, Dr. Katie Finley. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Next slide, please. So we engage in a pretty robust um, ongoing program evaluation because we're really interested in knowing um, if our programs are working and if they're helping women and children in the way that we intend them to, and um, how to go ahead and improve those services through research design. So some of our data collection goals are to really understand the impact of our programs on the outcomes for both the mother and the child. We wanna be able to evaluate the program effectiveness so that we can make improvements. Um, we wanna focus on program sustainability and reporting to funders and then highlighting models of integrated care. So we would like New Jersey to be a leader in the type of programming that we um, provide for women who are pregnant and postpartum. And then we wanna disseminate uh, these findings as best practices so that we can continue to collaborate um, with other states and within our state to um, develop the best, most effective ways to provide services to um, pregnant and postpartum women. Next slide, please. So we do this um, by collecting information um, with our data collection tools at um, three distinct time periods. We collect it at program intake, uh, birth and postpartum, and then program discharge. This really helps us to track the trends over time and to get a sense of how the program is functioning and like I said, how we can make improvements. Uh, we're really focused on specific categories, one being treatment and recovery information. So we want to know if the mom's engaged in treatment, is she utilizing MAT, um, and what level of care she's utilizing. Um, infant birth outcomes, 
health information for both the mother and the infant, housing and employment status, and child welfare involvement. One thing that um, we've been able to do, given um, the state of our world, we've been able to really change our data collection tools and to focus specifically on COVID-19 and how it's impacted both the services that our women have received and the way that they've experienced um, service delivery. So we're really focused specifically on engagement and type of contact, um, addressing those gaps in services and additional needs, um, mental health during COVID-19, and then any additional programmatic and outcome data. Um, we try to do this as an ongoing process. So when we identify things that should be added to the survey, we go ahead and add them and we work with our providers to ensure that we can track this information over time. Next slide, please. So we just wanted to provide you with some additional resources that you can check out um, in your own time and with our contact information if you have any questions, either programmatic or research-based um, about the MRAP or the IOT SEI program. And that's all. All right, thanks so much. Those um, were great. Uh, great resources. We'll keep those on the screen for a moment. And, um, you know, great information that you shared. So uh, appreciate uh, your time again. Um, next, we are going to turn the presentation over to Brad Christensen. Brad. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'd like to specifically thank uh, Partnership for Drug Free New Jersey, alongside the Attorney General's Office and NJ Cares for the opportunity to give this presentation. Um, my goal today is just to give a general overview of um, the impact of opioid use and abuse on veterans and also speak um, specifically about uh, treatment options that are open to veterans uh, in the state of New Jersey. Next slide, please. So substance use disorders um, are a significant problem for our veterans, um, and we are noticing a particular problem with opioid use. Um, it is on the rise uh, among veterans with a specific current concern um, regarding the veterans of what we call OEF, OIF, um, which is the current conflict, which we expect to be ending this year. Um, and while uh, substance use problems happen to be lower, if you look at the entirety of the veteran population from uh, World War II veterans all the way down to current veterans, uh, we actually notice that there is a, a higher use rate than the general population when we're looking at veterans from the current conflict, which are veterans who have served si since September of 2001. Next slide, please. Uh, so when you want to understand opioid uh, use and abuse with veterans, it's important to understand all, how it coincides with the mental health uh, difficulties that a lot of veterans experience upon discharge from the service. Um, so veterans with a mental health diagnosis are more likely to receive an opioid prescription. Um, so mo the most common mental health uh, diagnosis you're going to hear veterans talk about is PTSD, uh, and it is of specific concern. Veterans with the diagnosis of PTSD have a 17.8% chance of receiving an opioid pres prescription versus 11.7 for veterans who are diagnosed with other mental health disorders and 6.5% uh, for those without a mental health diagnosis. On top of that, we've also noticed that veterans who are diagnosed with PTSD are more likely to receive higher doses of opioids, uh, simultaneous prescriptions of uh, opioids alongside other opioids or other sedative narcotics and are more likely to try for early refills. Um, PTSD affected veterans are also more likely to develop opioid use disorders, um, which used to be referred to as opioid abuse, but uh, is now the, the uh, diagnostic term for opioid um, abuse. Um, and they also are more likely to experience adverse outcomes such as uh, inpatient or ER visits, opioid related accidents, overdoses, and violence related injuries. So certainly a significant problem. Next slide, please. Um, and we should also talk about polysubstance use disorders, uh, abuse of different um, drugs at the same time. Um, opioid use is a specific problem for veterans, but um, we have also noticed that um, for veterans who are struggling with opioid use disorder, uh, the majority of them also struggle with abuse of, of other substances. Um, so 35.9% of veterans with opioid use disorders were also treated simultaneously for two or more other substance abuse disorders, 
Um, and then 22.9 were treated for one other. So that adds up to 58.8% of the population. And the most common current co-occurring substances we see abused alongside opioids are uh, alcohol and cocaine and cannabis. Next slide, please. So um, alongside the unique problems for veterans um, in terms of opioid use and abuse, we also have unique treatment opportunities. And um, as is to be expected, the most prominent and accessible treatment available to veterans who are struggling from any substance use disorders in New Jersey comes through the VA healthcare system. Uh, the veterans who are enrolled in the VA healthcare system can access a variety of levels of care to address their substance use issues. Um, and that goes all the way from residential care all the way down through the steps of care to outpatient care, which, which I'll go over in more detail. Um, I want to take a point before we move on just to indicate that um, it is important that veterans are enrolled in the system. While it is possible for a veteran to access the system for the first time and get enrolled as they are starting treatment, it adds a lot of stress to the process. And, and not every single veteran um, is, is eligible to utilize the system. It is, there is a tier system. Um, that a veteran has to qualify for in order to use the system. So uh, if, if you have any veterans in your life, uh, we always encourage them to enroll in the VA healthcare system, even if they don't ever think they're going to use it, because if they ever need it, they're enrolled for life, um, and it makes the process much easier. Next slide, please. Okay, so how do you access VA substance use treatment? Um, so um, if a veteran is concerned about their own use or a family member is concerned for them, there's a few ways that they can access the system. Um, so if a veteran is really struggling with their substance use to a level where it might be putting them in danger, um, a risk of overdose on opioids or alcohol or uh, any other uh, chemical you can overdose on, uh, anything that ha could potentially have a harmful and dangerous withdrawal, including alcohol, benzodiazepines, uh, they can just walk into the emergency room at the VA Medical Center, which is in East Orange, New Jersey, and they can say that they're struggling with their use and they can get admitted to the program uh, same day. Um, if the issue is less urgent but still requires treatment, um, the veteran can call uh, the medical center at East Orange, the VA Medical Center in East Orange. That, that number is 973-676-1000. And they can either just dial the operator and ask for the substance abuse services, or they can dial either extensions 1558 or 2580, and they'll be transferred to somebody who works for substance, uh, the substance abuse services at the VA who can talk through the admissions process and answer any questions that they may have. Next slide, please. Uh, so what is uh, the substance abuse treatment at the VA like? So the VA provides services to meet the severity of each veteran's treatment needs. Um, a lot of veterans who access services in the VA Medical Center access a start with a 30-day inpatient residential rehabilitation program. Um, they, can, uh, they offer both opioid and substance, uh, sorry, both opioid and alcohol detox alongside um, the therapy that a veteran will receive in the inpatient program. Uh, just a note, this program is normally centered at the VA Medical Center in East Orange, New Jersey. However, they've uh, taken it upon themselves with a little bit of a lower admission rate during COVID to renovate the, uh, the facility at East Orange. And now uh, it is currently being run at the Lions VA campus, uh, which also means a reduced uh, number of beds that they can accommodate. But uh, my understanding is they are planning to move back to the East Orange campus soon and move into brand new facilities. Um, so when a veteran completes their uh, inpatient uh, residential rehabilitation program at the VA, they can discharge down to uh, what's normally considered the intensive outpatient program, where they continue group and individual therapy. Um, normally, when a veteran steps down from the inpatient program, they'll step down to a seven-day week program if um, their schedules will allow it. Um, and that, I find that to be much more generous than a lot of the programs that are available to civilians. Normally, when a person steps down from inpatient, they'll step down to an IOP program that is three to five days a week. So um, the flexibility of care and the and the, it's, a, it's a little less jarring in the VA system, I've noticed, for uh, for veterans to, to move from an intensive to a less intensive level of care. Uh, so treatment in the, in the intensive outpatient program just will taper down from five days a week to, sorry, seven days a week to five days a week. Um, and, and what they're aiming to do is just to provide um, an, an option for the veteran to continue with that same sober support system they started with um, in order to help maintain the recovery. Next slide, please. 
Um, and then once they complete the intensive outpatient level of care, um, they're offered the aftercare program, um, which can last up to two years. So that can, they can continue with their same counselors um, and they can continue with um, the same support system that they've developed. Um, and, and they're able to, to, to continue that program into uh, what we consider long-term recovery. Um, for veterans who are just looking for uh, medication-assisted therapy, so uh, normally that would be opioid maintenance, um, they could be maintained on methadone, suboxone, and naltrexone. Um, and uh, I got information from the, um, the people who run the program there that they also recently got the option to do injectable suboxone. So suboxone that is injected on a monthly basis. Um, which, is, which is an excellent uh, service that they're now able to provide. Uh, the VA uses a combination of approaches to meet the needs of veterans. Uh, they use a program that's 12-step informed, but also incorporates some cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational interviewing to try to address all the needs a veteran might have to address their substance use issues. Next slide, please. All right, so for veterans who might need more intensive services than the 30-day the inpatient program, uh, there is a long-term residential treatment facility available from the VA. Uh, veterans can receive services at the long-term residential program in Long Island. That would be the typical program that they are referred to because it is, is considered in the, the vision or the area of, of uh, VA healthcare services that we live in. However, they can also be referred to Pennsylvania where, where there also is a long-term uh, facility. Now, veterans who do not have VA healthcare benefits to serve in a combat zone and still receive treatment at their local vet center. Vet centers are a little, a little different than actual VA medical centers or VA outpatient clinics. Next slide, please. Uh, so I work for New Jersey Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. So I wanted to give you a little bit of detail about the uh, services that we provide. So uh, New Jersey Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, we don't provide any uh, specific treatment services. That, that's not our aim, but we do have services that overlap with the services that are provided by the VA. We help uh, the veterans try to access the, all of the benefits that are available to them. So let me just go over briefly some of the services we provide. Probably the most uh, prominent service we have that is that is linked to veterans with um, substance use disorders and substance use issues are our veterans haven programs. Our veterans haven programs are transitional transitional housing programs available to homeless veterans to help them get back on their feet and, and to regain uh, their ability to maintain stable housing. Uh, we have two facilities, one in Glen Gardner, New Jersey, uh, it's Vets Haven North, and another in Winslow, New Jersey, Vets Haven South. That, and we provide support to veterans in recovery while they're in our program. So veterans who enter our program must be sober upon their entry, but because they're there for a while, some veterans could be there for you know uh, over a year. Um, they uh, have access to 12-step meetings on site, substance abuse counseling services, and we can transport them to off-site recovery meetings if they if they desire, although we recently have had the benefit of getting people to come in and provide 12-step meetings on site. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the counselors at the Havens will work with the veterans to maintain their recovery throughout the program. And if a veteran continues to struggle with um, their use while they're at the program, um, we can either refer them out to the VA healthcare treatment that we uh, that I was um, referring to before, or you know if they if they can't access those services or or prefer different services, we will work with them to find counselors and programs that will work with um, their benefits and and help them regain their recovery and, and restart their journey of sobriety. Next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to talk a. Uh, briefly about our veteran service officers, which includes myself. I'm a veteran service officer for the state of New Jersey. Um, so I wanted to highlight our veteran service officers because I believe that they are a wonderful resource to any veteran who has any questions about their available benefits. Um, veteran service officers can help veterans understand their eligibility for VA services, uh, fill out the forms to apply for the services because there's always a form and is usually complicated and advocate for veterans if they run into any difficulties during the process of, of application. Um, that is specifically important in regards to substance use issues because um, let's just say, for example, we have a veteran who served in the military, saw combat, and now is struggling with substance uh, abuse. 
Normally, the way the VA healthcare system works, it is uh, works like any other hospital. They take your insurance and they provide services and treatment, and then they bill your insurance and then they bill you for whatever you are responsible for. If a veteran applies for what's called a service-connected disability, if they feel like they have PTSD or substance use problems that are caused by their military service, if they apply to the VA for benefits for those issues, and they are approved, any healthcare provided by the VA for those uh, disabilities are completely served completely free of charge. So if a veteran is service-connected and disabled because of their military service for PTSD or substance use uh, issues, they will get all of that care that I talked about from the VA healthcare system for free. Um, and in unique situations in which uh, combat veterans require treatment for PTSD, which we understand is a, as a pretty serious overlapping issue with substance use uh, difficulties, and they can't utilize other services, um, our VSOs can also refer to some state paid therapeutic services um, so we can address those issues and allow uh, the veteran to access um, a mental health provider who hopefully is local to them and, and, uh, and provide a link to care. Next slide, please. Okay, In, as part of my information gathering for this uh, presentation, I was very fortunate to be able to talk to Dr. Christopher Gates, who is the section chief for our New Jersey healthcare system and also the entire area of uh, New Jersey. He was gener generous enough to offer his contact information. So if you have any other questions about the VA healthcare system and how they can provide substance abuse services to veterans, he volunteered to allow you to email him his email, Christopher.gates at va.gov. And if you have any more questions about the New Jersey Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, uh, our VSOs, or our Vets Havens, um, the best resource is our website, which is nj.gov forward slash military forward slash veterans. You'll find tabs for our Veterans Havens programs and our Veterans Service Officers. Um, you know, and, and if anybody has any further questions, they can always reach out to uh, Matt at the Partnership for Drug Free New Jersey, and, and I'm, I'll be happy to get in touch. Uh, next slide, please. And my final slide is I just wanted to provide the reference information for, um, for my research um, for anybody who requests my slides after the presentation. Um, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for the ability to talk. Thanks so much, Brad. That was uh, really great and helpful information. I know we were able to share the phone number uh, to the East Orange uh, location that you shared in your presentation in the chat. I um, also want to mention, I know in the chat, there's a lot of conversation on whether you'll be able to get a copy of the slides or recording of the presentation. Just want to make note uh, before we uh, introduce Kathy that uh, you will be receiving, as Greg mentioned in the beginning, and for those who missed it, um, after this presentation later this evening, um, you'll be getting a copy of the, um, the slides, the link to the slides, as well as a recording of today's presentation that will include all of the resources uh, that have been discussed today. Um, so now we'll, um, thanks again, Brad. I appreciate it again, like everything that, uh, like I mentioned, everything that you said. And um, we'll move on to uh, Kathy. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you, Angela. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to participate in this session. Today, I would like to tell you what Project ECHO is how it is positively impacting vulnerable populations and addressing the opioid epidemic, and why I'd like you to join us. You will hear how Project ECHO convenes a diverse group of learners and leaders to promote greater health equity and address the epidemic. Next slide. Our Project ECHO program began in 2016 with a commitment to improve public health and well-being while reducing healthcare disparities. We provide timely education and training for frontline providers, and by building collaborative learning communities who are dedicated to solving public health challenges, we increase access to care across New Jersey. Our 2020 and 2021 ECHO programs have focused on critical public health issues, including COVID-19, opioid addiction and mental health, diabetes, substance exposed newborns, trauma and adverse childhood experiences, and multiple echoes aiming at improving maternal health. Next slide. We solve for these big problems by bringing together doctors, nurses, social workers, addiction and behavioral health specialists, educators, community health workers, community organizations, and community representatives. 
our participants come together on a live Zoom call, which provides a platform for our virtual learning. Meeting bi-weekly, this community of learners learn about updates in their field, learn about how to address an issue or challenge that's been brought forward by their participants, and they have the opportunity to address social determinants, medical needs, and determine a course of action. We call this an all-teach, all-learn model, where participants learn from subject matter experts and they learn from each other. One of our endocrinologists always likes to say, I've learned more today from you than you've learned from me. This model of learning results in increased self-efficacy, in knowledge of the topics that have been taught, and in provider confidence and use of evidence-based guidelines. As part of an evaluation study, we recently were able to demonstrate significant improvements in patient outcomes as well. An important note- Kathy, I don't, um, I don't want to interrupt you. Um, we're getting um, uh, feedback from you. I'm not sure if you, maybe you're a little bit too close to your microphone, um, but we're getting um, some feedback noise. So just wanted to give you a heads up about that. Okay. I'll sit back a little, see if that helps. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you never know. Okay. I, didn't want to, I didn't want to interrupt all of the important information that you were no, sharing. That's okay. That's Thank okay. you. Sorry that's to have fine. to interrupt you. Usually people think I'm just talking too softly. So um, I'm sorry if this was a little confusing there. Um, two out of three of the registrants um, who attend our ECHOs serve the top 12 counties with the highest poverty rate. And in our postpartum early warning signs echo, 33% of the attendees were from the top six counties with the highest infant mortality rates. So we try to look at these key public health issues and recruit attendees from the different counties where it's imp impacting them the most. So whether you're motivated to help an individual or change your community, I believe Project ECHO can help us accomplish our goals in New Jersey as we combat this epidemic. So Angela, is there less echo now? Um, yes, it's still a little bit of static that we're hearing, but um, you sound fine. You can go ahead. Thank you. Okay, good. Uh, next slide. So first I want to point out that 50% of the echo participants represent social workers, community health workers, addiction and behavioral health specialists and other community organizations. While 43% of the participants provide and support medical care. During 2020 and 2021, we offered four different ECHOs that to varying degrees focus on opioid addiction. A substance use ECHO focuses on adults and covers opioids as well as alcohol and other addictions, helping providers understand best practices for medication assisted treatment and recognizing the mental health implications, talking about how they can change their practice of care and using quality improvement methodologies. This ECHO is led by Dr. Petra Slavonis, a psychiatrist from the Rutgers University, New Jersey Medical School, and a team of experts from across the state. One of our maternal child health ECHOs discussed by Chris, or mentioned by Chris Scalise, focuses on pregnant and parenting women with an opioid use disorder. This ECHO is led by Dr. Campbell and Dr. Roche, both from the New Jersey Medical School Department of Obstetrics and trained in addiction medicine. They're supported by a peer support recovery specialist, a social worker from the New Jersey Department of Families and Children, and a specialist in perinatal addiction from the Central Jersey Family Health Consortium, as well as guest speakers. The eighth session echo on postpartum warning signs was offered this year to provide education to emergency personnel um, to doctors and families about the warning signs after birth that can lead to complications for moms. This echo is led by Dr. Lisa Gittins in conjunction with Drs. Campbell and Roche, Suzanne Spernal from RWJ uh, Barnabas Health, and Dr. Karma Warren in emergency medicine. And the fourth one, our neonatal abstinence syndrome echo, was led by Dr. Caitlin Baston and Dr. Charlotte Nussbaum at Cooper Health. They brought together community organizations and hospitals together with state organization and local providers to address care alternatives for babies who are born substance exposed 
and also looked at how to provide effective ongoing support for mothers and infants as they return home. I wanted to point out the diversity of experts we bring together is that sharing of knowledge, breaking down silos and having different perspectives and what makes a difference is what makes a difference in the educational model and how we can improve outcomes for children and families. We have registered over 2,400 providers to attend just these four ECHOs. Next slide. So as you can hear, a number of our ECHOs focus on the impact of addiction on moms and families and their infants. This stems from the recognition of where New Jersey is today on matters related to maternal and child health. Our maternal and child programs um, really try to focus in on a mother's well-being both before and after delivery to improve birth outcomes and expand support for mom, family, and baby when they are discharged. We also teach all types of first-line providers to become more aware, better trained, and better prepared to address the complexities of addiction and its impact. We focus on bringing communities together with health systems to address systemic change, which is needed. We also provide training programs to support new workers, such as community health workers and doulas. So next slide. By now, most of you recognize that the pandemic has been considered a traumatic event, especially for our children. They've missed school, many have fallen behind academically, and some kids are experiencing depression and anxiety as a result of being isolated from their friends and extended family. One other echo I would like to mention that can help with the impact of the pandemic as well as addiction on our families is our Adverse Childhood Experiences Echo. It is helping health and social service providers understand the trauma created by the pandemic as well as the trauma created by addiction in a family and helping to teach them to identify and treat the trauma to help kids and families cope and move forward. Next slide. So sometimes it's hard for people to understand exactly what ECHO does. So I thought that it would be useful to tell a really short story about one of our ACES ECHO um, cases. We'll call this young man Charlie. He was 16 and morbidly obese. He was often absent from school and acting out. The school counselor and his mom focused on disciplining Charlie's actions, but weren't making much progress. Charlie's pediatrician shared this case with the ACES Echo, and fellow participants asked questions and made connections that his school, his family, and his doctor hadn't seen. It turns out that Charlie was a healthy weight at 11, before his parents divorced, his mom went back to work and he was forced to change schools. In the new school, he was bullied and turned to food for emotional support. Anchored in this understanding of Charlie's trauma, the ECHO members discussed the options available to help him. They aligned on specific recommendations for therapeutic interventions and resources for Charlie's pediatrician and family. This echo discussion had a huge impact on Charlie's life, but it didn't stop there. Charlie's story also informed the practice of over a hundred other healthcare providers who were on that Zoom call that day, who saw how widening the lens to see the whole patient picture was critical. This is how echo creates a ripple effect that helps so many families and children. Next slide. So to close, in the last year, over 20,000 individuals and over 1,200 local organizations have registered for our programs. Participants have overwhelmingly ranked the program high on use of evidence-based guidelines, and almost every single participant surveyed has implemented recommendations they received from their peers and experts in this learning community. This means that approximately 10 to 12,000 providers who serve vulnerable populations in New Jersey have not only received support and education, but they put that information to use for their patients and their clients. Next slide. So what does the future of our ECHOs look like? Because we focus on breaking down silos, shifting systems, and improving outcomes for children and families, particularly in disenfranchised, in, sorry, in disenfranchised communities, there are many ways that you can help make a difference with Project ECHO. 
If you've been affected by the opioid epidemic and want to know more about what can be done, or you'd like to have an impact on other health or other public health issues, I encourage you to register for a session. Visit our website and find the epo, epo, echo topic that means the most to you and join us. If you're on a healthcare team, work in social services or community health or at a school, please join our community. There's no cost to participate and you can earn continuing education credits while getting valuable support and practical timely knowledge from a diverse group of providers. Together, we can improve patient outcomes and help build healthier families. Next slide. So thank you. I hope you'll join us and thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Kathy. Um, appreciate all of the information and resources you shared, and um, I know we um, have a lot of information that came through today. I know there were um, some questions um, that came in, so we'll, we'll get started. Um, I think we have time for a few questions. Uh, we'll start with our first group of uh, panelists, um, Catherine and Christine. The question for you is, um, do you work with moms who are separated from newborns? So, for these two initiatives, and, and Katie can also jump in, when we're saying separated, if, the, if mom is pregnant for the maternal wraparound, first of all, for the maternal wraparound, she needs to be pregnant to be in the program. With the integrated opioid treatment, and if mom has an opioid use disorder, because that is the target substance, because it comes from the governor's opioid funding, um, if the Division of Child Protective Services has removed that infant and the plan is to reunify with mom within the 16 weeks, you know, post birth, then she would be eligible. And I believe Katie is also accumulating data or collecting data on um, within that time period. Is that correct, Katie? That's right. And we, we track a variety of child welfare involvement um, variables. So we are able to, to know um, at what stage our moms join the program and then what some of the circumstances um, that are involved in their particular cases. All right, thanks. Uh, appreciate that clarification. Um, Brad, this question is for you. What access to local care do New Jersey vets have if um, they don't live in the East Orange area and they live in other parts of the state? And are there resources to help people get to East Orange if um, that is the only location that they can go to? So uh, I will I will admit that transportation to the East Orange campus is, is an ongoing problem uh, that that the VA struggles with. Um, there are some organizations I think um, probably most prominently the DAV who provide transportation for veterans, um, but it's still a hole in our system. For other, for other forms of treatment. Um, so the, the most important uh, reason to get to East Orange specifically for treatment would be if somebody needed to access the inpatient program. Uh, for outpatient services, the VA has services all over the state. So they, they have services at their um, community-based outpatient clinic. Um, and and uh, if you go to uh, the VA's website or even just Google, uh, VA community-based outpatient clinic. Uh, you should be able to find a list of the clinics available in New Jersey. Um, any of those clinics can provide um, outpatient services for substance abuse. Um, there also is the option for vet centers. Um, the vet centers were started um, around the Vietnam era by veter Vietnam veterans who didn't think they were getting great care from the VA, but they've since been folded into VA services. For any combat veteran, they can also access the services at any of the vet centers in New Jersey. Um, and for anybody in a unique situation, I would encourage you to reach out to one of our uh, New Jersey DeMava VSOs uh, to talk about that program where we can actually recommend uh, a service member for private counseling that the state will pay for, uh, for services at four sessions at first. And then um, if there's continuing need, we can pay for uh, ongoing services for that veteran. All right, thanks. And, and one more for you, Brad. Um, is there any um, funding available for alternative 
treatments such as equestrian treatment or other types of um, alternatives? Is that something uh, that is supported by the? So that's an excellent question. I would I would actually encourage um, who, who, whoever may have asked that question, and I think it's a good one, to reach out to Dr. D. Um, it, it's it, equestrian, especially, is interesting. Uh, I imagine that would be something that would have to be provided at the, at the Lions campus of the VA, because if anybody has ever been to the um, to the VA Medical Center in East Orange, New Jersey, you know, space is at a premium and open space isn't very available. But um, you know, I, it, it would, I would be interested in knowing whether there's any federal grants that are available to that. And I think Dr. Gates might be able to better address that question. All right, thanks. And I know that uh, Dr. Gates's information is included uh, in your slides that will be shared with all um, attendees. So uh, if that was your question, please um, follow up. And um, Kathy, can you provide um, just some additional clarification on how someone can um, refer to the ECHO program? Um, sure. Refer a client or uh, someone that a student, thanks. Yeah, so if, um, if they know a provider, uh, whether it's a medical provider or social services provider that um, has joined one of our ECHOs, they can ask that person to uh, bring up the questions that they have or uh, talk to their providers about joining the ECHO. And all the ECHOs are listed on our website. So you can see there um, how people register. Oh, great. And um, I guess this is a, a question across the board. Um, we can start um, maybe with you, Brad. Um, has telemedicine or um, outreach um, improved during this time for vulnerable populations? I know you talked about a phone number, but is there other ways of, uh, of communicating, I guess, via telehealth to get the services needed for the veterans? So yeah, I, I would say that, that COVID has certainly forced the VA's hand. Um, and and I, would, I would say that uh, the VA typically is slow to pick up on, on those, um, you know, on, on new technology and, and new ways to approach treatment. But, but I, I have noticed that there has been a significant uh, increase in telemedicine and, and, and remote uh, services during, um, during the pandemic. Um, substance abuse is a specific challenge because, you know, a lot of the higher levels of care kind of demand, uh, you know, uh, the veteran's presence in order to do effective treatment. Uh, you can't do an inpatient program at home. Um, but I know that they, they've been very, very careful at implementing um, strict guidelines and protocols in regards to COVID uh, during uh, the pandemic and, and all of the spikes that we've been having, um, you know, and, and trying as, as, as much as they can to work around those limitations and, and to provide as many services as appropriate remotely. All right, thanks. And Kathy, are you seeing um, that adjustment and has that um, helped people to access the uh, ECHO project? Uh, I think it's been easier for providers um, across the state to, to access ECHO um, and participate uh, because they can do it from their home. We have people who call in from their cars as well as their homes as well as from work so that has been um, a bonus i think from uh, people being becoming more comfortable with zoom technology and webinars and uh, that's been good for us um, on the telehealth side uh, working at the robert Wood johnson medical school what i've seen is that um, they are using everyone's using telemedicine but there are populations that have difficulty because they don't have internet access. Uh, they may not have a smartphone and they may not have a computer at home. So we've been trying to do a lot of work to make sure that people get education about how to use and access technology um, so that they can take advantage of telemedicine applications. All right, thanks. And uh, Catherine and Christine, do you have anything you wanted to add to that question? From the, from the substance use disorder treatment component, yes, telehealth has, 
helped because of the um, uh, the allowance of it. But I need to say on the recovery community side, it is so important that individuals who are in recovery can have access. And um, we're finding that our recovery centers are working closely, um, well, through the COVID uh, pandemic and what the rules and restrictions were about, you know, entering, you know, buildings. Um, they have really focused on developing great communication. So we've seen a, a real uh, towards improving how their Zoom meetings, recovery meetings. So they've really built that um, option. All right, thanks. So we're coming to the end of this, our time. I have um, one more question for, for all of you. Um, so we know from everything that you shared today, what your organizations are doing and what the state of New Jersey is doing. Um, so can you speak to what all of the attendees today can do to help share the important information uh, that you shared? And uh, we'll start, Kathy, with you. Sure. Um, I would encourage you to join an ECHO and experience it directly to see if it helps you with um, managing your patients or clients or gives you more information to help make a change in your community. All right, thanks. And Brad? Um, I would just encourage anyone who has any further questions or is in any way confused about the veterans healthcare system or any of the benefits available to veterans because it can be very confusing um to reach out and try to find a veteran service officer um state of new jersey employs veteran service officers including myself um, there are also other organizations such as state of american veterans and veterans of foreign wars and vietnam veterans of america who employ veteran service officers and they're all employed to provide free assistance to veterans to help them understand their benefits to help them navigate what can be a, a confusing and frustrating system and, and to streamline the process of, of getting help, getting services, and getting what's owed to them. So if you have any questions going forward, um, a state VSO or any VSO, and, and just let me preface this by saying any veteran service officer who is legitimate should never charge a veteran for their services. Uh, please reach out to a veteran service officer for any further information and for help navigating all right thanks and thanks for that uh that tip about uh costs and charges there um christine and Catherine, anything that um i would i would I recommend can. i would recommend that any individuals that have questions around treatment prevention treatment and recovery supports feel free to visit the department of human services website and link on to the Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services, and it should give you a list of resources. And also that if it is a pregnant and parenting woman, especially pregnant women who is abusing opiates or, or heroin and other opiates, uh, they are considered a priority population. And we also have the um, interim management entity, which I don't have the toll free number now, um, I'm sorry, but the IME, is they can reach out, call that toll-free number, and they can get a screening and be re, uh, referred to uh, treatment. And I think that that's really something that everyone needs to know. Uh, that'll be listed at the department's website. But anybody that needs treatment, prevention, treatment, and recovery supports, feel free to visit our state website. And anybody that you know, or a family member or someone who you are concerned about that has developed an opioid dependency, they can reach out to the interim management entity for um, screening and referral to treatment. Thank you. All right, thanks. And uh, Catherine, was there anything that you wanted to add? I'll just echo what Chris said. And um, if you have any questions about our specific programs, just to reach out to us. Thank you. Thanks. And if you have that, um, phone number, if you guys want to send that over to us, we'll make sure that we get that in the uh, post-event email uh, that's going to go out to all of the attendees. Um, there is an um, evaluation that has popped up on your screen, so um, I'd ask if you could please uh, fill that out and uh, give us some feedback on today's presentation. We would appreciate that. Um, again, I want to uh, thank all of our panelists for sharing your expertise today 
And again, to all our participants for joining this conversation to knock out opioid abuse and address addiction in our communities and our state. Um, information on the upcoming webinars um, on uh, Knock Out Opioid Abuse Day, which is going to be held October 6th. And we're going to have uh, some tips in a uh, webinar next month, um, along with other resources and copies of this presentation are available on the project's website, knockoutday.drugfreenj.org. And we'll also be following up, as we mentioned, with each of you with a uh, copy of the slides from today and um, some other resources and information. So thank you again for committing to be part of the solution to New Jersey's opioid crisis on behalf of the Partnership for Drugs in New Jersey, New Jersey Office of the Attorney General and MJ Cares and all of our panelists today. We wish you continued good health. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Be well.